Okay, sorry about that. We lost the connection there while I was recording. Um, I think I think I saw exactly where it stopped, though, so we can um, pick back up where we left off. I think, although I had to reboot my system, so let me restart up my dev box. Um, And uh, make it up. Um, okay, good. I still got up. We'll have up the repository, sign the six repository. Um, and boot it back up again. And then to that. And yeah, so the last thing I think I was doing um, before the video, before we lost the connection was um, um, I was trying to compile. So I think we'd gotten through all the steps. I'd shown that it's not compiled because I had uncommented this out. So I was gonna go ahead and put the header, um, um, the, uh, the, the, the function prototype that you're gonna need here. But let's, let me just check real quickly. Um, so we configured, we were trying to confirm project builds um, on, and I guess we could add the task one. I'll, I'll leave that up to you guys. Um, so as I was saying, when we when we stopped before is that um, um, all four of the functions that you're writing um, actually have the same um, signature. So they take in as input and then they return the nth Fibonacci number. So they, they basically take an integer as input um, and um, return an integer result, right? So, uh, so me giving you this um, signature um, um, will actually be given it for um, all of the, uh, the, the functions for this um, this assignment here, because they all look the same, just the, the, the name changes. So we're going to be implementing four different versions of, you know, four different algorithms with different algorithmic complexity for calculating the nth Fibonacci number here, right? Um, so as usual, uh, make certain that you um, don't, don't do the function documentation as an afterthought. You should, you should be um, committing so, so when you commit for the task one, I mean, the function documentation should be there. You shouldn't be committing the, the function documentation for multiple tasks after the fact, right? So, so waiting till you get everything working and then going back and adding your function documentation. So you should be committing you know, your function documentation um, for task one with the, 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 the commit for the Fibonacci linear um, function, right? Um, but for all these, actually, though, uh, in this case uh, as well, so the, 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 the implementation, the algorithm, so, so the body of, of our functions is going to be different, but they're all doing basically the same thing. So, um, the first one is you have to implement using a linear algorithm. So given um, um, uh, input in, uh, calculate the uh, Fibonacci number in the Fibonacci sequence, uh, where the sequence is defined as F zero equals zero, F one equals one, and F n equals F n minus one plus F n minus two, All right? So, um, so this uh, implementation calculates the in not your number uh, using a, a big O of n linear time um, algorithm.
Um, so we have one parameter, which is in the um, um, which number in the Fibonacci sequence we should write and return in this case. It returns an int result. So um, calculates and returns the nth Fibonacci All right, so something like that. So that there's a there's a again another good example of function documentation for this function. So all these functions will be pretty similar, except you know they're going to be the the implementation uh, is going to yeah, differ, right? Um, And as usual, we can put in a stub here to make certain that we can compile and run. Right? So everybody should be doing this. Um, I mean, most people by this point have figured this out and have been able to get past this point, but you should, that should always be the first thing you do. Um, it's kind of about the last thing on the checklist. Um, so, so um, well, um, this, this is kind of the first thing before you start task one and before you start each task. So, so uncomment the task. Uh, and then create your step function, create your function documentation, have it return some dummy value so you can make certain that you can compile and actually run the test. And then you can begin writing your code to implement uh, and, and start passing the test, right? So uh, we should be able to build this time, assume I didn't make any mistakes. Um, and we should be able to then go to three to run our tests. Um, and see that we are running. Um, and our first one that's failing is 43. We're, we're returning the hard code value of zero, so we're passing F zero, um, but um, um, not getting any of the rest of them. Right. Well, all, and, and in fact, all of the, the, well, the, most of the, the task tests, so task one, two, um, and four and five actually have the same set of tests just for a different function. So we, we test the first um, um, 10, uh, so n from zero to n 10 of, you know, calculating the Fibonacci sequence for your function. Then we, we calculate a few bigger ones all the way up to 46. And, and in fact, we also calculate 47, but um, 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 you'll end up returning the wrong value because it'll overflow. So you'll get like a, a negative number or something when you calculate that. Um, so, so we're expecting it to be false, that, that you get the wrong answer if you've got it implemented correctly, just because it overflows the integer there. So that's what's happening with the tests. Um, So uh, let me open up the description here again, um, say a few more things. Um, all right, so for the first one, you're implementing using a linear time complexity, um, so, so, so a linear algorithm. All right, so um, actually it's gonna end up being that you're Fibonacci linear and the second one you're gonna implement is a Fibonacci recursive. So implement it using recursion. Um, but, but these are gonna start off, both of these are gonna start off similarly because uh, even for the linear approach, you should handle the two initial conditions as special cases. So if you're asked to calculate uh, um, N zero, you should just uh, check if So if N is equal to zero, just return zero. And if n is equal to one, return one, right? Or alternatively, you could check if n is less than or equal to one and return n to handle both of those cases. Although those have slightly different um, 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 implications for like, like handling error conditions. So for negative one, if you explicitly check zero and one, you wouldn't be handling like negative numbers, right? Uh, but here, this will return uh, like negative one if you pass in negative one for n and negative two 
right? So, so um, both of those are kind of wrong. But like I said, though, uh, you don't have to worry about uh, error handling um, on this assignment. So, um, um, so, so you know, you can always assume that n will be zero, a value from zero to forty-six, or actually zero to forty-seven. So. Um, so if it's not one of the initial conditions, so n is zero or n is one, you have to write a loop. Um, so to do this loop, you want to initialize three local variables uh, and you want to start it off. So you have to have a variable to be the, the, the Fibonacci number that was two back in the sequence and the Fibonacci number that was one back in the sequence. And these should be to initialized to zero and one, right? And then you're going to start the loop implementing to, to, to calculate F2. So you'll just be adding in. So, um, so you'll have a third variable that doesn't need to be initialized to anything, but in the loop, your third variable will just sum up the previous two, you know, so whatever the, the n minus two value was and whatever the, the n minus one value was, right? And then your loop should basically loop from two up to n, right? So if, if you're asked to, to calculate the uh, n equals two, the loop would only run one time and it would just sum up zero plus one, which is one. And, 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 and then after, you know, after the end of the loop, you should be returning that value, whatever the final value was that you summed up, okay? And then I skipped over though, um, um, after you calculate the nth Fibonacci number inside of the loop by summing up the previous two Fibonacci numbers, you have to shift all the values. So you have to copy whatever was uh, the, the, the one previous to become the, the, the two previous value, right? And, and copy whatever the n was that you just calculated to become the n minus one previous. And that's in preparation for the next iteration through the loop. So once you shift those down, the next time through the loop, when you calculate in, you will have shifted these down. And so you'll calculate the next Fibonacci number in the sequence, right? And this works in linear time because this loop um, um, goes from two to n here, right? So it's, it's, it's technically n minus one, but that's a, that has a big O prime complexity of n, right? So depending on which value n you want to calculate, um, it can take up to n iterations of this loop to be performed, all right? Um, um, so this, this is a big O of n, so, so this is linear time complexity. So the second one, uh, you have to implement using recursion. Um, and we're going to be doing a particularly naive version of recursion for this first, for, for task two here, right? Um, so uh, this will look pretty similar to begin with. So your, um, um, your two initial conditions are going to be like the base cases for your recursion again here, or one initial condition, depending on how you do it. So when n is zero, just return zero. And when n is one, just return one. That's your base cases. Uh, but otherwise, if it's not zero or one, simply return, call the Fibonacci recursive recursively on n minus one and on n minus two and sum that up. And that, that will be the result that you will return, okay? And then if you work this out, so, so you know, it, it, if you haven't done stuff like this before, it may not be immediately obvious, but this is a really bad, because, you know, when you call like uh, n minus one, n minus one is itself going to call uh, its n minus one and n minus two, but its n minus one is actually n minus two, right? So um, um, the, 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 I think our textbook talks a little bit about doing Fibonacci, um, for um, um, exponential time algorithms, right? So, so the problem is, is that there's going to be an explosion of a repetition of, of lots of calculations done unnecessarily, right? Um, so if you work out the recursion tree, and maybe I'll do that um, on Thursday, or actually maybe next week um, when we're studying for our first uh, midterm exam, I might um, look at this one a little bit more detail to get some more practice about um, algorithmic complexity. Um, um, so anyway, you'll find that this one will take a long time. And in fact, task three um, um, and task six of this assignment, we're going to be measuring the um, 
algorithmic complexity. Let's go ahead and uncomment task two and also task three. But there's actually two test cases for task three. Um, You don't really have to do anything for the first uh, test case for task three. So the, the, the first one is just uh, showing you an example of doing some empirical timing tests of the performance of the algorithms here, right? So in this case, we're using um, the, the Chrono library to um, um, get very precise timing down to nanosecond timing here. Um, so, so yeah, we're, we're able to measure things down to nanoseconds, which is a billionth of a second here, right? Um, and, and so we start a clock before we run your linear version five times um, and then end it afterwards. And then we take the average of that. So we, th this is common when you're doing empirical testing like this. So by taking the average of some number of runs of the um, of calling the algorithm, that smooths out smooths out um, some variations that you get from you know the operating system doing things and other stuff like that, right? So, so this will be more indicative. Um, although we only run five iterations, we could have run many more because the linear version is really very fast, right? So so we, we're only calling it for the fourth Fibonacci number. Um, so so n is forty. So it's really pretty small. But but we use five iterations because you'll find if you do your recursive the correct way. But this takes significant time to calculate the 40th birth because this is an exponential time algorithm. So this will take like a second, maybe or two. Um, so on my computer, it takes a little less than a second. I've got a pretty good computer. So you, you, you might find yours takes a second, two seconds, three seconds to do that. So, oh, and in fact, I, sh I should have mentioned um, um, by default, um, I've got the, um, the bigger versions of, you know, the calculating the 42nd, 43rd, so on, uh, commented out by default for task two, but you might want to uncomment those and try them out at least once to get a feel for how long it takes to actually calculate and run each of those, right? So when you do the task two, you know, you might try those uh, to get another example for how long it takes to um, calculate each of these. Um, Oh, and then um, I kind of want to wrap up here. So, um, uh, the last, uh, so, so I'll say also, there is something you do have to do for task three. You, there, there's, um, um, we want to do, we want to count up the number of operations or the number of function calls for the, the, the second version of the function, the recursive version. Um, so to do that, we kind of have to open up the black box of these functions. So if you look inside of the, uh, the, the Fibonacci.cpp file that we were given, there's a couple of global variables defined and also a, a function that was defined given to you that you need for task of um, five or six here. But in particular, there, there's a global called operation count. So what, what you're supposed to do for your linear version um, is you need to count up the number of operations, right? So, you know, before um, you run the loop, for example, when, when you test the, like an if statement, like a Boolean comparison is an operation. So, so, so operations are things like uh, doing Boolean comparison, doing arithmetic, so adding or subtracting values, um, uh, you know, incrementing. So it went in your loop here, um, when you run your loop uh, in the linear version, you know, you're, you're gonna have like a, a loop counter variable like i that's being incremented and you're also testing whether i is equal to n um, for your loop to see whether the loop is done or not. So those are two operations there. Um, and uh, you don't have to count function calls. Um, um, so, so for the recursive version, you'll be calling Fibonacci recursive. But um, um, you should count assignments as well. So assignment is an operation um, and uh, so on, right? So yeah, what I ask you to do is, uh, depending on how you implement it, you might not get exactly the same result here. So in, in the version, in, in the, the um, example solution, um, there was two constants. So one was the, the, the number of operations that happened outside of the loop. And remember, the loop should happen n minus one times. I told you that, so it should go from two to n, right? 
So, and this was my count of the number of operations that was happening inside the loop. You, you can normally, you should never be modifying the, the code in the, the unit tests. You should only uncomment the, the test cases, but not actually modify the tests. But for this assignment, you can, because you, you can make some slight differences in, in how you implement things, right? So in that case, you might have to modify the C1 and C2 constant to get the, the calculation correct. Uh, but, but this should in general be the number of operations that you do outside of the loop, that's your C1, and the number of operations inside the loop, right? Um, And uh, you should do the same, a similar thing for the recursive, Fibonacci recursive, except for in this case, to make it simpler, uh, I, 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 I simplified the task. So you only have to count up the number of times that the Fibonacci recursive function is, is actually called. So in that case, you don't have to worry about trying to figure out exactly how many operations happen each time. Just put one single statement that increments operation count at the top of your Fibonacci recursive function. And that will count the number of times that you enter in or call. The Bonacci recursive. All right. Um, yeah, and we'll talk more about that on Thursday, maybe if people have questions about that. Um, and so let me just briefly mention task five and six so I can wrap up. Um, there is what's known as a, um, um, a closed form or an exact solution. So, so this expression um, expresses. Uh, how to calculate the, the nth Fibonacci number. So you take this constant, which is a phi, um, raise it to the power of n, divide by the square root of five. And, and this here is actually being used, this notation means to round the value. So you have to round the value to the nearest um, decimal place. So if it's above 0.5, you go up to the next integer, or if it's down 0.5, you go down to the next integer. So this is round, round to the closest integer. So you have to use the, the POW function from the CMath library, and you have to use the ROUND function from the CMath library, and you have to use the square root function for, for the square root of five, right? But, but, but you should be able to do this um, calculation fairly simply, right? And again, this is just constant time. So every time you have n, you just uh, perform these calculations. So, so phi to the power of n, divide by the square root of five, and, and take the, um, uh, and, and round that to the nearest integer, and that's your result, right? So that, that'll just take five or six operations to perform. You know, so power is an operation, square root is an operation, division is an operation, rounding is an operation, assignment is an operation. Uh, the, the fee uh, is actually not available in the CMath library. Um, so we define the fee constant um, for you, um, again, at the top of the libfibonacci.cpp file, which is where you need it. So, so this is what the value of phi is. This is known as the golden ratio. And, and the Fibonacci sequence has a relationship to the golden ratio. So if you read the Wikipedia articles that I link to, uh, you might get an idea of, of what the relationship is between the Fibonacci number and this golden ratio here. Um, Yeah. And then finally, um, and we'll talk more about this on Thursday, if people want, um, um, we're going to implement another recursive, kind of recursive version, but we're going to do it uh, recursion uh, in a non-naive way using this technique called memoization. And I'd also encourage you to maybe do a, a quick read over of the Wikipedia page on memoization. So this is also known as tabling. It's kind of a fancy name, but it, it's, it's really kind of just a caching technique, kind of like caching. It's like a just-in-time caching. So uh, for, for memoization, what you do is you, you keep a lookup table. Um, and I've already defined the lookup table. So you're going to be using uh, the, this table called Fibonacci table. And it's just a table of integers, right? And initially, all the values except for 0 and 1 in the table are set are, are not calculated yet, all right? So for memoization, what you do is you first check the table. So if, if you're asked to calculate the 40th Fibonacci number, you first look up in the Fibonacci table and see if the, the value in the Fibonacci table at index 40 is not calculated. And if it's not calculated, you're going to calculate it basically by doing a recursive call like you did for the previous task. So you call Fibonacci mem memoization recursively on n minus one and n minus two to calculate the nth Fibonacci number, right? And you sum those up, but, but then, uh, and then you stick that into the table. Okay. So you only do the step one if 
the, the value you're asked to calculate was not calculated. And then afterwards, so after checking if it's calculated, you know that either the value was just calculated and was put to the table or it had been calculated sometime in the past and had been cached in the table for some time. So after, after you do this in like an if statement, uh, you should be able to just directly return that value from the table. So you know, you know after this, you will have the, the value calculated that you were asked to uh, find um, when Fibonacci memoization was involved. You just look it up and return it. Right? So that's what memoization is. And then there's a task six, which is the same as task three. So we do an empirical performance measure of the time of these the last two functions, and we ask you to count up the number of operations in them so we can compare those. All right, um, so I'm gonna go ahead and end the session for here, and I'll post this for anybody that's um, watching these asynchronously. Um, if you have questions, uh, let me know, uh, send me an email. Um, oh, by the way, um, I might be doing these help sessions uh, from the, uh, the, the the big auditorium in journalism, what's it, uh, 129, I think, or something like that, just because um, um, I'm also doing the help sessions for my class at 11 after this, so this will make it easy for, easier for me, less time to, to break down and set back up, so. Um, so that's where I'm at. So if, if, if you are looking for face-to-face, -face, um, instead of going to my office, come down to the Journalism 129 from like 9 to, to uh, 12 or so, and, and I'll be in here running these help sessions for the classes. So. All right, that's it. Um, and I'll see you guys later then.